All right, everybody. With me, I have the authors of a brand new book. Let's see here. I'm, 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 I'm on Amazon. Goodbye, Religion, The Causes and Consequences of Secular Secularization. Yep. Um, and that is uh, Ryan Cragen. Say hi, Ryan, so everybody can see who you are. Hello, everyone. And um, he has been on the show before. And a new guest to the show, Jesse Smith. Right here. Hello. Yeah. Now, uh, for those listening to the podcast, this, is, this interview is also going to be available as a video. So you can go to YouTube and check it out. So if I say we're looking at this person or that person, I apologize to the audio listeners. It may not make sense, but that's why. Uh, if you're listening to the podcast, I don't think you're going to miss anything out other than seeing the three of us in full color glory uh, talking. And of course, I have a lot to learn about Zoom and Zoom recording. So please forgive me in advance if it's shitty. Anywho, this book, as of the moment we're recording, is not technically out, but I was able to buy a copy uh, from the Freedom from Religion Foundation conference, and it comes out only days after this recording, and people can pre-order. Is that correct? Yep, that's correct. It comes out October 8th. Is that right, Jesse? That's right. Yep. 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 So, And I'm yep. looking at the Amazon page, and it says pre-order, price guaranteed. Uh, and on October 8th, I don't know if they send it on October 8th or if it lands on your doorstep on October I think 8th. it should land on the doorstep. I'm, I'm hoping. So now I'm assuming you guys planned this. This is being delivered just in time for Christmas. Uh, I don't know that that was the plan. <laughs> well, um, but hey, you know, if it works, great. Right. Yeah, it'd make a great Christmas gift. I like to think it is. And I don't know if Ryan knew this and Jesse wouldn't know this. One of the themes I've had over the years is encouraging people and children out of religion. Now, I'm assuming you guys aren't necessarily taking a position of advocacy one way or the other. You're researching the data and trying to explain it to us. So before I ask questions about the book that I just half read, half skimmed, my apologies, time crunch. Uh, is there anything particular you'd like to bring up about the book or other works? Just, just feel free to jump in. Well, you know, I'll say that um, I was thinking about this just before we got on here. Uh, you know, Ryan and I, Ryan approached me about this. The, the, the idea for the book was his, really. He approached me at a conference a few years back. And it struck us that we both um, had something interesting here to contribute to a book that would kind of be, we wanted this to sort of be, you know, the book on religious exiting in the US. Um, I've done a lot of interviews um, throughout my career and have you know expertise in, in qualitative research methods. Ryan's done a lot of uh, quantitative work and we just thought, you know, this is a good opportunity to do a solid mixed methods project on um, the ins and outs of uh, why people are leaving religion. And so that's kind of where the, the idea was born. I think this was probably, that was a while ago, 2018, 19, yeah. Ryan, something like that. Yeah. Um, so it was several years in in the making. And we thought that it would be um, interesting. It was a nice way of kind of capping off a lot of research that we've done over, you know, really a couple of decades here. And that it would be of interest. You know, there's, there's a lot of important changes that have happened, uh, even in the time that we sort of conceived of, of the book. So we were excited to put it together and hopefully people get some some use out of it. How about you, Ryan? You want to throw in anything before I have some comments? You know, I, I think Jesse really hit it. Uh, we've been working on this for a long time. I, I do like to mention that my my doctoral dissertation in 2007 was on people leaving religion. And this book is way better than that. <laughs> well, I, I think in the book, it even said you were wrong, basically. Yes, but, I was. Okay. Right. I, so I, I remember somebody, that. Part. Somebody was reading the book pretty closely. <laughs> right. Uh, you know, Jesse and I have both been working in this area for a very long time. And like I mentioned, my dissertation was on this, but I've learned a ton, right? Like the beauty of being an, an academic, a professor and doing research is like, I'm always learning. I love that I just could continuously get to be learning. And this book is the culmination of, you know, over 20 years of working in this area and kind of hopefully, you know, being right at the cutting edge of the discipline. So yeah, it's, it's a great collaboration. We had a good time doing this. Before we get into some of the details, I want the listeners to know, you know, spoilers. First of all, we're going to talk about what's in the book. Uh, again, the book is titled Goodbye Religion, 
colon, the causes and consequences of secularization. It is a, I think, a wonderful blend of what uh, Jesse mentioned, qualitative and quantitative analysis, uh, data and statistics from surveys, research studies, you know, where people get to pick numbers and you can run calculations on them. But it also has a lot, uh, several hundred, several thousand uh, interviews uh, and snippets and sound bites from people expressing their nuanced opinions uh, about where they came from, how they got there, where they're going. So it's a, I think, I, I don't know. I, I think, uh, I think it was Jesse that said it. This, this is, or Marie Rose Ryan, this is now the, the most thorough, complete work on the subject. Uh, and again, from qualitative and quantitative. And uh, one of the things that I really liked was early in the book, the discussion of who's leaving religion. Mm-hmm. And maybe the stereotypes were true 20 years ago, but maybe they're not now. What were the stereotypes and why are they less reliable today? Yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, I'll, I'll jump in if that's okay, Jesse, and then mm-hmm. you can fill in some details. So if we go back to like the 1970s and 80s, um, there were some people who had left religion and there was some early research. Um, probably the earliest research is from the, the late 1960s. Um, the, there's very little before that, really. Um, and most of that research was basically focused on young white men, um, particularly well-to-do, highly educated men, were like the most likely to leave. And so that's where, the, I mean, it all got framed as like risk factors back then, right? Because leaving religion was a bad thing. So it was like, oh, the, these are the people at risk for leaving. Um, and that was kind of true, right? They were statistically slightly more likely to leave religion, but it's not like they were the only ones, right? So even if we go back then, it was like a 60-40 split between men and women in terms of who was leaving religion. So it's still 40% of the people who were leaving religion were women. Why we turned that into, oh, you know, it's mostly, you know, white men, uh, that wasn't true. Same with race, right? If you look back and look at race, it was always a sizable percentage of people who were leaving were black or other races, right? So it was never just white men. It was never just highly educated white men. Um, that is a bit of a stereotype for like atheists. And there's some truth to that still, but it was never as big as we think. And those gaps have shrunk over time to where today, particularly like the gender gap, it's almost a parity. It's almost 50-50, which is pretty interesting. Um, age, uh, the age gap has shrunk. The educational gap has shrunk. So all of those have basically shrunk to where today, it. I think Jesse's the one who wrote this. It's like, everybody's leaving religion, right? Now, we don't mean everybody, but we mean like, it could be anybody is the idea. Demographics just doesn't do a really good job of, of predicting who's leaving anymore. What did I miss, Jesse? No, that's right. Um, just on, on down the line, all of those different variables. I think it's just an assumption that was just kind of baked into, you know, the way that Americans think about this issue. Um, it, it is, it is technically true, right? Statistically true that there is a slight difference there, right? So there is, we've got some language in the book about that, but I think people have just made way too much of that. And those, again, all of those gaps continue to shrink. It's just not, um, we we can't predict very well at all who's going to leave religion based on, you know, sociodemographic characteristics alone. Because I know when I first started getting involved um, in the secular movement myself, um, maybe 20 plus years ago, I was the young white guy compared to the old white guys. <laughs> um, and a lot of people in the organizations felt like they couldn't join an outspoken atheistic organization until they retired because they were so concerned that they would lose customers or clients. And, you know, if you have a normal business with a five to 10% margin and you lose 10 or 15% of your customers, you're done. You're toast. Yeah. You're cooked, as the kids say nowadays. <laughs> um, that, yeah, and that's, and that's part of what's happening here too. I think you're right. The um, the negative connotations, the social stigma, the context has changed, right? So that's sort of yeah. given a boost to um, the the rise of those that are leaving religion, just because it's there's a, a context now where it's more plausible to do that. A- know, absolutely. That and I was focusing not only on people that left, but people that were obnoxious. <laughs> vocal about the fact that they had left where yeah. today in 2024, if I just look up YouTube videos, 
it's men, it's women, it's white, it's black, it's Hispanic, it's it's every kind of person, LGBTQ Mm -hmm. people that are coming out and either their fear is less than mine was, or they're doing it smarter, or they can so quickly start making money with it. Uh, Wow. What a change that you could make money with, you know, being an outspoken advocate. So so that's absolutely fantastic. After the initial discussion in the book, I think it was nine things that can kind of predict uh, mm-hmm. who might leave is it was it was it nine things do i recall that correctly probably the propositions yes yeah. yes propositions yeah. um can either one or both of you go over some of those and how reliable are they or how, how important are they sure um i'm gonna try and pull them up in the book uh we yeah. actually have a list of all of them right at the back of the book so maybe i'll just grab oh, those so we can go through them. it's so funny because as i was reading i'm like oh, i wish they had started with the list at the beginning and then gone through the nine and then had the list and since yeah. mine is a pdf in progress yeah uh, yeah. uh yeah it's it's towards the end um so i i i, I kind of apologize but like where we're laying them out, we have to build up an argument. I, this is kind I of understand. standard. Yeah. Yeah. So we had to build up an argument to then give, and here's why we're going to give the proposition. But at the end, we did want to recap them for everybody so everybody could see them just like straight in the list so they knew exactly what we were doing. Um, this is, a, I guess, a little bit weird for maybe a lay audience that we're getting formal theoretical propositions, but that's a big part of what we do as academics. Yeah. We're, we're trying to lay out these propositions, one, because we have evidence to support them, but two, this makes it so other people, other scholars can then go, well, there's a formal proposition. I can go test that, right? So we're, we're really trying to advance the field by laying these out and formalizing propositions that make it so people can test them. So happy to go through those. I did pull up the list. I've got yeah, them. Yeah, grab, so, grab a couple. Uh, yeah. So <laughs> using our pretentious Latin, because you know we have to do that as scholars, but I'll just say what it means. So we, we start most of these with ceteris paribus, which means all else being equal, right? So we're scholars. We have to do the Latin. Uh, the very first one is individuals who hold more modern egalitarian views will be more likely to leave religion than those who hold more traditional views. Jesse, you want to jump in and explain what we what we mean by that one? Well, yeah. And in some ways, these are just descriptions, right, of the evidence that we're proposing here. So I, I like Ryan's point about like these are propositions that can be tested, right? They might not all work exactly as we think that they are. Right? Yeah. Those are absolute statements of of, of truth, right? So um, they they can be tested, but yeah, uh, this comes from both the, the survey data and the um, interview data. Um, those people that tend to accept certain, um, you know, modern explanations, really, and scientific explanations of, for instance, the origin of the cosmos, uh, human evolution, the age of the earth, you know, those kinds of things um, are statistically <clears throat> much more likely to exit religion than those who hold uh, views that don't. Um, you know, embrace those kind of um, modern sort of findings. We use the word modern very, very broadly, right? That that can mean a lot of different things in in different contexts. Um, But yeah, uh, that that one in particular, and that's that's our first one, Ryan. That's the very first one, yeah. Yeah. Um, It's just a kind of a very generic general propositional statement saying that, you know, um, you, you shouldn't be surprised if those that accept the you know very kind of basic um modern statements about the nature of of reality yeah. are more likely to exit religion it's it's pretty much that simple and it, it's not any kind of double blind kind of tested thing it's something that's no. been teased out of the data and it looks like it's clear strong and compelling uh yeah. so there's probably no no specific p value that you've assigned to it, it you're making yeah, yeah. the proposition based on what you've seen and mm-hmm. like you said, I, and I didn't pick that up in the book, so I'm thankful that you explained it to me. It's now something somebody else can grab any one of these nine and try yeah. to find a more formal testing mechanism or uh, you know, an, an, another bit of research that supports or disproves yeah. the proposition. And it's another reason that we left it sort of toward the end of the book, listing them out, because they really, they just, they're sort of, they mirror back what the data is is showing as we build this argument uh, throughout. Yeah, I, I, yeah. I like it. Ryan, you want to grab another one? Sure. Um, so we'll we'll do number two. We probably shouldn't do all nine, but let, I wasn't going to do, do all two. nine. Okay, <laughs> good. <laughs> <laughs> that'd be, yeah, that'd be the whole podcast. Yeah, and they need to buy the book. 
So yeah, there you go. I appreciate the promotion. That's good. That's good. So uh, let's do number two, and then we can maybe skip down, and I'll I'll pick a different one. But uh, so all else being equal, ceteris paribus, individuals who have more progressive social and political values will be more likely to leave religion than will individuals who have more conservative social and political values. I think that one's pretty clear on the face of it, right? Uh, basically, people who are leaning to the left are more likely to leave religion. Now, admittedly, and Jesse can fill in some of the details here, we go into a lot of depth on this particular topic because of some prior uh, research and proposals that have been put out there that we we take issue with a, a number of other proposals, but we really go deep into this one. Jesse, did you want to add on that? Well, it's, I think it's probably worth uh, mentioning um, the, the Houghton Fisher argument about yeah. you know, um, the kind of the stepping stone thing away from religion. What is motivating people to exit religion, right? On the, uh, especially the influence of the religious right. Why don't you give us a brief walkthrough of, of that? Yeah. So um, there's an article from the early 2000s, I think it's 2001 by Houghton Fisher, where they basically made the, this claim that the alignment of the religious right with the Republican Party, right? So, and we're we're not trying to be political here. So, we're, we're trying to be apolitical, right? We're just describing just the literature. The just the yeah, it's just the data, just right? The data. So, they make the argument that the alignment of the religious right with uh, conservatives has actually led a whole bunch of people who don't agree politically, right? So, they they disagree with the conservative positions politically. That they're like, oh, well, if my religion is going to associate with uh, conservative politics, I'm going to leave religion. And we argue that that it's at a minimum missing a step, right? Yeah, yeah. Because and and maybe we're being too generous to people. Like maybe people do leave for those reasons. But in our minds, we're like, wait, uh, if I really value religion and my particular religion just becomes more conservative, why would I give up all religion? Why wouldn't I just go to a different religion, right? right? More yeah, and so yeah, more progressive religion. And that's not what Houghton Fisher argued. They argued like, no, no, this is why people are leaving religion. And we're just like, no, that doesn't make any sense. So we, this is why we spend quite a bit of time like filling in details saying, well, maybe it could start a pass, like a, a pathway out of religion, but it just doesn't make sense for it to immediately be like, oh, you know, uh, my religion is now conservative, Republican or whatever. I'm out. I'm giving up all religion. Like it just didn't make sense to us. So we do unpack that quite a bit and spend a lot of time on that. I would react. Oh, so go ahead. No, I was just thinking out loud here. Uh, can't it be both? It could. You yeah. know, maybe there's two big categories there because I know a lot of people, uh, once someone changes from one religion to another, from my perspective, they're now more likely to eventually become an atheist. I don't know if there's data for that, but I think I've seen it. But I also have met a lot of people who were really into their church and really when politics got in and they had problems with the politics, they started having problems with the politics. Then they started having problems with religion. And sometimes the most conservative religions, you don't wander your way out. You, you break. And yeah. when, you, when you leave Jehovah's Witnesses, when you leave Mormonism, you often don't go somewhere else because it it was you were so deep that you have to snap out. But yeah, no, I th I think you're right. I think it definitely can be both. The question is what what's the general pattern if if there is one. This actually links up to our conclusion. We deal with this a lot, as Ryan said, right? When people, um, you know, if those that sort of do um, go to more progressive religions, right? That's something that more aligns with our political and social values and beliefs, et cetera. Um, the, we kind of argue that um, that context isn't radically different from just the secular society at large, right? So there might not be a lot of reason or motivation to stay um, with a particular progressive religion, right? They're already part of... Um, it's already sort of consistent with broader secular values. And so right. that, that might kind of be a, a bit of a halfway house before becoming fully, um, you know, a secular. We can, you know, we, that's kind of how we end part of our conclusion there. So we can loop back to that, but I think you're right. There's, it can be both yeah, things. It could be certainly both. Yeah. All right, Ryan, pick a third one of your choice. Cause like, like you said, you don't want to mm -hmm. the whole video, the whole. Yeah. <laughs> 
Yeah, um, we have a lot of this, we have a lot yeah. of typologies and uh, little yes. lessons going on here. So there, yeah. there is a lot. All right, let's that. let's jump all the way to the end, right? So maybe then we can turn to something else. Is that okay? Yes. Yeah, if we go right to the end. So I I actually really like this one. Uh, proposition nine. Uh, it doesn't actually start with ceteris paribus. This is kind of a fun one. The larger the proportion of someone's social network that is non-religious, the higher the odds they will leave religion. Uh, and that one, I think we end up talking about in a slightly different chapter. I think that comes up not in chapter three, but like chapter five or something like that. Um, this it's it's an under-researched area from my perspective um, on kind of the influence of social networks and people leaving religion. There's a little bit of research on this. I was involved in a simulation study, actually. So it was computer simulations where we were, we were kind of modeling this. But the basic idea is the for a lot of people... Uh, we're going to go a little bit on a tangent. A lot of people like to say, I left religion because I thought my way out of it, right? Mm -hmm. And that's probably true for some people, but it's also a story we tell to make us look better, right? Yeah. It's like, I'm so smart. I figured it out and everybody else is wrong. But I think reality is actually much muddier than that and more complicated. And I think for a lot of people, it's, you know what? I saw somebody who's not religious and it gave me this idea of like, oh, that's a possibility. And then my social network shift because maybe I moved or I got a new job or I, you know, whatever it was. And in that in that shift, maybe I moved away from some of my really religious friends and I got some friends who weren't as religious or maybe not religious at all. And so the shifting social network can actually be much more influential than I think we realize. It doesn't necessarily bubble up into our consciousness that they're actually influencing us. But in fact, there's a lot of really good research to suggest that our social network is a very strong influence on the things that we do. And so all we're arguing is if you actually get a, a, a more dense social network that's connected to people who are not religious, that's going to dramatically increase the odds that you're going to leave as well. What do you got, Jesse? Yeah. No, I mean, uh, we we deal with both, I think, um, in in the book, all right? So we don't want to downplay because a lot of scholars will tend to downplay the cognitive intellectual dimension, right? It's not really about beliefs, right? It's about it, it's about it's about anything other than what people actually believe, right? And the, <laughs> and the claims that religions make and people's cognitive assent um, to those claims or not, right? Um, but we we actually write that you know beliefs matter, right? They matter a great um, deal, right? It's important, right. but it's just it is just half of the um, of the story, right? Uh, we're sociologists, and so we're by and large taking, we take a, a social and psychological kind of a, approach to things, but we're largely explaining things um, in terms of external social forces, right, and and processes. And so, um, you know, that's that's what we're focused on, and social networks is one of those kind of external forces, right? It's It matters um, the context in which a person is, is living their lives, right? And if you've got, as Ryan said, even just one friend, right, that's um, not religious or has left religion, right? And you and you look at their life and it's it's not a disaster and they seem like a normal person. It kind of opens up this space, this realization, right? So there's there's an emotional and social component to this as well. It's not merely people sitting there, you know, um, you know, engaging in in their powers of reasoning and reasoning their way out of you know uh, religious dogmas and claims and things yeah. like that. Because I I am fascinated myself with the idea of of how, why people leave religion. And to, so when I meet people that have left religion, I always want to hear their stories and there. There's some common themes, but they're almost always different. <laughs> uh, yeah. So it's fascinating. Yeah. And I don't know if either one of you would want to uh, speak on the subject, but what could we as individuals or a society do to help nudge people out? Ooh. Are you willing to go there? Hmm. To nudge people out of religion? Yeah. yeah well, I have to just up? say for myself, Ryan gets to say whatever he wants to say. <laughs> about this. Um, to me, um, I'm. Uh, it's not an advocacy book for me. I really don't. Um, yeah. I'm not interested in in you know making people non-religious, right? Um, that we we really do just try to you know describe the the data and the importance of you know what are the consequences of this undeniable shift right the religious and the non-religious alike all recognize that more and more people are leaving religion mm -hmm. and people have a lot of um, concerns about this um, I'm not a you know I don't um, I don't really advocate I, I don't need people to be atheists for instance instance right it's not a it's not a 
an end point or, right. or an answer to anything t to me. It's just, um, you know, a, a lack of um, any particular belief in any particular um, God. So uh, Ryan might have something a little bit different Ryan, to hear about this. He, he might have a more of an advocacy disposition. Yeah. But that, anyway, that's me. Yeah. Fair yeah. Uh, I mean, certainly the way that we frame the book is it's not an advocacy book, right? It's, it's a fair scholarly enough. book and that's the idea. So it's very meant, much meant to be just like, this is what we found. This is the reality of it. Um, here, I, I'll give kind of a, a weird uh, lead up to what I'm going to say. Um, as, as an academic, right? Like I try and just be, scholarly to the extent that I can and objective that to the extent I can. But occasionally I do get asked to take these positions. Um, I was actually invited uh, about a year ago um, to go speak to a bunch of researchers at the headquarters of the LDS church, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And they wanted me to give the opposite perspective. How can we stop people yeah. from leaving religion, right? And uh, the which is weird, right? Uh, I mean, for people who know me personally, which I'm not going to get into my personal stuff, but like, um, that's a, it's a weird position for me to take. But if you're just asking it from an academic standpoint, I think then I can kind of don that hat and say, all right, well, from a surely academic standpoint, are there things that we could do that would actually lead that path, lead down that path? So I did that for the LDS church, like given your question, let's just put on that hat, right? And say, well, yeah. if that's what you are interested in, based on the research that I have seen and that I've done, are there specific things that we could actually do? The first thing that I'd say, and this is going to run counter to, I think, what a lot of people think about when they're like, ooh, you know, doing this. If you attack religious people, their natural uh, response is to defend. So attacking is actually not particularly effective at getting people to leave religion. Um, it if you think about it, right, like we've probably all been in those situations where we're talking to somebody who we disagree with politically, maybe religiously. And if they attack us, right, it's the rare person who's like, hmm, you know, I'm not going to defend any of my beliefs. I'm just going to listen to you and like right. wait to get your good points here. Right. And I'm, I just won't defend anything. Right. It's really hard as humans to just be like, yeah, you just have great points and I have nothing to respond to that. So the idea that um, we could be hypercritical of somebody who's religious when we meet them and just be like, well, here, this is wrong and that's not true. And like, if you do that, they're just going to defend. So from my perspective, a, a far more effective way to actually, if it, again, donning that hat, right? If I were trying to get people to be like, hey, that's a possibility, um, I would be a really good person, right? Set a great example for them, illustrate to them that I can live a perfectly healthy, happy, normal life without religion, and what that's going to do is basically plant these seeds of like, oh, wow, right? Like this person is perfectly right. fine and they're not religious. And that in and of itself, I think, is going to do most of the work is just being a decent human being. Instead of constantly berating them, fighting, attacking, that's just going to make them defend. And the more they defend, the stronger their beliefs are actually going to be. So well, again, like, donning that hat, I think it would, yeah, that would be probably the best way to approach it. Point nine, you know, the, the more secular or more worldly your network is, um, that might suggest if, if an atheist uh, had an agenda like I do, that maybe one of your goals would be to join more groups where it has nothing to do with atheism whatsoever, yep. make a whole bunch of new friends, so that if you make five or 10 new friends, each of those five or 10 people now have one more atheist in, in yep. their bubble. Uh, even if you never talk about religion, that, that might just be, you know, a little tweak mm -hmm. on the knob. Um, we can do more thoughts if you really want to, but I also want to try to get through more of the book. Sure. I don't want to take two hours. Although well, I, I just wanted to throw in there too. None of this is to say that it's not enjoyable to watch a, a good debate, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah. I, I, I like the argumentation. I like the debate. There's a, there's a place for that, right? It's just yeah. not necessarily what we're up to in the book. And part of our introduction, actually, we we kind of juxtapose these two viewpoints. Like, here's what religious leaders and what the religious might say or think about what religious exiting is going to mean. And then on the other side of this, here's what non-religious people might say about this. Ryan alluded to this already with. The idea that you know they they reasoned their way out of it they just you know they're very smart and so had to leave right it's like i think the way we phrase it is about it's like looking in a funhouse mirror right there's like these opposite um explanations yeah. for why they left right and yeah. our point in the book really is that 
they're both, you know, sort of wrong. It's it's really something in the middle that best mm -hmm. explains what's what's happening. Because I'm gonna skip by a whole section, but I'm gonna mention it to the viewer sure. and or listener. Uh, there's the whole section on people getting pushed out mm -hmm. of religion and people being pulled out of religion. And so to get all that, go buy the book. Uh, and then we get into the section that I thought was interesting is uh, what people identify after they've left religion. And it's been a struggle for a lot of organizations that I've been in where people say everyone should identify as an atheist. A lot of people identify as a humanist, a secular humanist, a free thinker, a skeptic. Um, mm -hmm. The moniker that I most often use, and I'm being intentionally provocative, provocative uh, if people ask me, I will tell them that I am an evangelical atheist. <laughs> you did not have that in your book, so I was not included. Yes. Sorry. So we can't <laughs> represent everyone. Yeah, that's okay. <laughs> Thoughts on that subject with naming conventions and identity? Well, let me start and then I'll have Ryan jump in here because um, part of this is a function of the data, right? The, the kinds of data that we use, um, for yeah. instance, a lot of the qualitative data. And we were careful not to, you know, not all of our interviewees are people that join secular groups. We have a whole section on sec secular um, joiners and non joiners, right? But many of them um, are. That was part of the way that I recruited many of the um, interviewees. And so they've thought a lot about this, right? They care about this issue. Even if they're not regularly involved in secular groups, they think a lot about their identity, right? And, um, you know, you'll get stories about people, um, you know, sort of strategically using different identities depending on who they're with, right? They don't hold any particular belief in any God, right? They're the technical functional atheist, right? But they'll use the word agnostic because it seems a little softer. A lot of people after they've come out, you know, and this can take time, sometimes years, decades even, um, they'll sort of, even if they don't call it this, um, they, they develop what is clearly to Ryan and I, a humanistic worldview, right? A secular and humanistic worldview. They're, they're naturalists. Um, they're, they're, they're skeptics, right? Um, there aren't supernatural components or agents in, um, that are part of their worldview. So even if they don't call themselves humanists, and many of them do, right? Um, many people don't really know, understand what humanism is to begin with, right? Yeah. So they're, again, they're sort of functionally, they're, they're humanists, even if they don't label. But we, you know, we've got stories of people really grappling with their identities um, and moving through different kinds of trajectories where there's a space in their life where, you know, how do I identify is critically important to them. And then later on down the road, it's like, eh, it doesn't, I don't really care. It doesn't really matter that much, right? What my, what my identity is. That's for those that really kind of, you know, deal with this, that had um, kind of the harder exit out of religion that you alluded to a little bit right. um, earlier, right? But for many of the more, um, you know, kind of the nominally religious, um, those were, that never were invested or really committed in any deep way um, in the first place, it's very different. They may just not even care or think about it. So maybe Ryan could say something about the indifference, right? The religiously indifference. Yeah. Um, I was going to mention that. So the salience, uh, that's the term that we kind of use for this, like how important is that identity for you? That varies a lot. And this is going to sound weird, but it's, it's, it's true, right? Like this is what the data say. The vast majority of people who leave religion don't then turn around and like must destroy religion, right? They're like, I'm just going to live my life. I'm going to go fishing. I'm going to go to the, you know, the football game. I'm going to do whatever. That religion just becomes unimportant to them. So we we often will refer to them as the religiously indifferent. And we don't mean that it, as though like you couldn't have a conversation with them and they might have opinions about religion. It's just that they're not actively engaged with anything to do with religion or non-religion or irreligion or atheism or activism. They just want to live their lives. They want to move on. So for some people it is a very salient uh, component, right? And these are the people who would go to an FFRF conference, right? Like right. Th it matters a lot to them. They see religion as a, as a problem in society and they're going to fight that. So that would be high salience for this non-religious identity. But the vast majority of people who leave are the ones that Jesse was just talking about. They're just like, you know, they kind of had a step in and now they have a step out and it just doesn't matter and they just want to live their lives. So we would say they have really low identity salience for this. They have lots of other identities. I mean, right. this is one of the points that we make in the book is like they do believe things. They just don't care about religion and they just don't want to live their lives worried about it. They're just going to move on. Absolutely. Uh, and I don't know that I want to spend time on it unless either one of you want to jump in because we're getting long enough that I, 
I want to wrap up at some point, but there's a whole section on uh, death uh, and what does that mean? And we can leave it as a teaser for the viewer slash listener, or you could address it briefly. But I also want to throw out, you know, is there anything related, even if it's not in the book, uh, that either one of you address, want to address or bring up or discuss before we wrap things up? Well, on the death uh, thing, I think I think we deal with some of that in chapter five, talking about the worldviews, uh, you know, the belief systems that the that religious exiters develop post religion, right? So there's yeah. a lot of questions left hanging in the air for some people after they've left a religion where there's sort of a a, a pre you know, determined canned answer about, I don't mean that in a pejorative way. There's just, yeah. there's a, a set of answers, you know, about the afterlife and about all the rest of it. Right. Um, and so some grapple with this, right. They know that they don't believe in any of this, you know, specific supernaturalist claims that the religion makes. Right. But what, you know, what do they um, believe? And uh, one of those issues is, is death, right. Um, what, what happens right. uh, after death. So people talking about the afterlife and what, what comes out of the, the qualitative data, anyway, um, you, we might get a little bit different picture if we look at uh, the survey research, but um, most of them tend to be just not adamantly like there's there's not an afterlife. I know that's the case, right? Um, not being a theist means not believing in an afterlife, which doesn't you know necessarily um, follow through. Um, but they just uh, they remain just kind of ag agnostic on those kinds of questions, right? Um, but the bigger lesson that we draw is that it doesn't um, deprive them of meaning or importance in in their lives, right? Like, so now I no longer believe this. So, you know, what's the what's the point of it all? Um, that's really just a, a false assumption that many people have, right? They are is absolutely intrigued by the mysteries of the universe, and they think about the cosmos and their smallness in it and their relationship to it, right? They they grapple deeply with all of these these questions, right? Um, and I, I don't know that we actually had anyone that said like, and I, I know there's not, you know, an afterlife. They're, they're just sort of like, many of them, again, by default, suggest that they don't, right? They don't expect there to be one, right? right? They, they think consciousness probably ceases with the death of the, the body and brain, but they don't make definitive positive claims um, about this at all. Um, that's on the, the death part. Ryan, is there something you wanted to add to either that or I think we're we're good on that. Uh, if we're wrapping up, I want to drop a couple of teasers about the book because there are some really fun things in there. Sure. Um, are we at that point? Um, yeah. Yeah. So we have a really fun discussion about what people do with their time when they're yes. not involved with religion. Um, and I'm just I'm probably going to leave it at that. But there's there's a little bit in there that actually has to do with uh, sex and sexuality too, which um, it's just a teaser. That's a yeah, teaser yeah. for the listeners, right? Uh, and that really is a very small piece. And then the last one I, that uh, Phil got to see at the conference, um, I did present on chapter six, which is the consequences for society. Yes. So if you remember the title of the book, it's the causes and consequences uh, of secularization. So we have a whole chapter that's like, hey, what are the consequences if more and more people are becoming non-religious? And we tackle that with really robust qualitative and quantitative data. And it's, it's loads of fun. I think that, I mean, but was it, was I think it, the book's a lot of fun, but yeah. was it 10 consequences? Yeah. So there yeah, are 10 questions 10, that we address. 10 yeah. concerns. I suspect that most people will be most interested in that final chapter. It starts, yeah. you know, with things like, will people donate less to charity? You know, right. will, they volunteer less? will they be less moral? Will they civic yeah, engage your kids? Morality? Right. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. loads of fun questions. And the great thing is we have data to answer all of them. Right. So yeah. we now have answers for this, which I think are a lot of fun. So a couple of teasers there. I, I found, and I, I think a lot of other watchers and listeners will find, I would read a section and go, okay, okay. That pretty much does it. What, what else could there be to talk about? Oh, wait, this looks good too. So it was a lot of that. Uh, it's, it's not a Harry Potter novel where you, you know, you, you've got to not put it down, but a lot of great information. Both of you did a bang up job writing it. The combination of qualitative and quantitative was superb, a generous, but not overwhelming uh, tables, charts, graphs. Uh, I, I like those more than most people. So I, yeah, you probably had internal debates between the two of you about how many of those to include. Um, I liked, I would have wanted more, but that probably means you did the right amount. 
<laughs> yeah, it is. It is a longish book. It's a little bit longer than than um, many that come from this uh, press. There, and there is a yeah. lot of data. So people that like data, yeah. that they'll like it. But we also, again, we tried to write this for a, a broader audience than just other academics that are interested in this question. I think there's something in there for everyone, and uh, I think people enjoy it. And like I said at the beginning, just in time for Christmas, everybody, you can go order it at any quality bookstore. Uh, the name Goodbye Religion, The Causes and Consequences of Secularization. Uh, if you have anything else to throw in last minute, I welcome it. Or you can give information on how people can reach you, maybe to have you present at, at their church or at their secular conference, whatever either one of you want to do. Jesse, you want to give your contact information? Yeah, um, I think, uh, let's see. Well, I'll just give my website. That's jessemaxsmith.com, uh, J-E-S-S-E. Uh, it's currently under construction. I'm trying to improve my website a little bit. Ryan's, yeah. Ryan's got his stuff together a little better on that question. Um, I'm not on social media. Um, and people can find my uh, email and contact info um, on my website. Uh, they can visit um, my department's homepage, too, at Western Michigan University. Yeah, and I, uh, you can Google me, so I'm pretty easy, but I do have a website as well, ryantcragen.com. Um, but if you Google me, there is another Ryan Cragen out there. He played football for UCLA, and we compete for the top spot in Google results, right? I think I'm winning right now, but hey, you know, a UCLA football player, like yeah. that's, that's tough competition, but I, I but usually come out right on top. You're trying to convince me that you didn't play football? I unfortunately did not. <laughs> Neither of us played football yeah. to, to everyone's surprise. Yeah. 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 Uh, I'm shocked. I tell you, well, <laughs> gentlemen, thank you both for writing uh, a book that I thoroughly enjoyed. And of course, spending your time here for my listeners, viewers, uh, I greatly appreciate it. Is there anything else? If nothing else, you know, of course, thank you for your time. Yeah. Thanks for having us, Phil. This yeah, was thanks for having us. It's a fun conversation. You gotta remember how to uh stop the recording. Yeah. <laughs> it was there earlier. Now I'm gonna have to edit something. There it is. <laughs>